presenter presenters is Lauren and Kira, and they're going to be presenting on American Sign Language. All right. So, hi, my name is Lauren. Hi, my name is Kira. And we, like Ms. McDonald said, we're going to be presenting on American Sign Language. So both Kira and I have had an interest in sign language since middle school when we first did our mentors sign language club at Baldwin. We've been doing it ever since. Um, also, my aunt has sparked my interest in American Sign Language. She's a special education teacher with certifications in sign language and has worked as both a teacher of the deaf and an itinerant teacher. Um, for myself, my mom is a speech and language pathologist, so I've had some experience um, hearing about the different ways of speech. And we've both had, um, again, that experience with Sign Language Club, but we wanted to further and deepen our service level understanding of both the language and the culture. So um, when we came into the project, we had a few goals in mind. First, we wanted to learn ASL to the furthest extent possible over the course of one year, and also to get as much exposure to the language as we could. So to do this, we started off by taking an online course, which we actually eventually ended up um, stopping as we moved further along in our project, which we'll explain why later. But another goal we had was to learn about deaf culture and the difference between big D and little d. So we did research, watched TED Talks and documentaries, and conducted interviews. Additionally, we wanted to complete research on other topic areas that interested us, for example, the history and origin of the language. And another main goal we had um, for this project was to learn about special education, as well as the relationship between special education and sign language. We were able to do this through our involvement in our mentor sign language club at the high school and through an interview conducted with my aunt, Carrie Shantara. One final goal we had for this project was to visit the Hartford School for the Deaf so we could sit in and observe a class and potentially interview a teacher, but unfortunately, we ended up not being able to do this because of COVID-19. Um, so really, we just started off with research and getting um, this foundational understanding of the language and its origins. Um, and just to walk you through a little bit of it, um, American Sign Language was first established um, in 1815 when Thomas Hopkins Gallaudet traveled to Europe um, to study methods of teaching deaf students with this desire to break down language barriers and create a more inclusive society. So he went to France um, and learned these teaching methods using LSF, which is the French Sign Language, um, from Laurent Clerc, a deaf teacher there, um, who he asked to come to America. So he accepted the offer and they came to America um, and their boat arrived with 60 days and in that time, Clark learned English and taught Gallaudet Sign Language. In 1817, they opened up their first school for the deaf um, in Hartford, Connecticut, and that's what's today known as the School for the Deaf. Um, and so just as this presentation goes on, just keep in mind that this introduction happened about um, in 1815 and it was in, until nearly 150 years later that American Sign Language was even recognized as an official language. Um, so just like any other language, ASL has its own grammar, syntax, and special rules. First and foremost, it's important to keep in mind that ASL is a highly expressive language. The use of facial expressions and body language is just as important as learning the actual signs. Additionally, sign language has a certain intimacy that comes with this expressiveness. When having a conversation in ASL, you are required to fully interact with the person, making eye contact and using directional signs. There are also, um, there are just a lot of more components to it than simply making gestures with your hands. ASL is also an interpretive language, so speakers might not sign something the Um, so, for example, on the East Coast, Santa would be signed differently than it would be signed on the West Coast. And I'm just going to skip ahead to the next slide to give you guys an example of this. So, in this first video, you'll see the way that Santa is signed in the Northeast and on the East Coast. So, as you can see, there's an emphasis on, like, a big white beard, whereas on the West Coast, this is how it's signed. So, there's more of an emphasis on the stomach, which is um, just the difference that there is based on where you are in the world geographically. So I'm just going to go back. And then another important point to touch upon from a technical standpoint is the difference between American Sign Language and Signed English. 
These two are often confused, the difference being that ASL doesn't mirror spoken English word for word. It follows its own rules of grammar and syntax and is actually more closely related to French than English because of its French origins. It's important to emphasize that sign English is not the true language of the deaf culture and that those who identify as culturally deaf find it extremely important to speak the language properly using the correct sentence structure and grammatical rules. Lastly, on this slide, I'm going to talk about fingerspelling, which is yet another um, form of sign language, although again, it's not the official language of the deaf, which is ASL. To fingerspell a person would use the signs corresponding with the letters of the alphabet to spell out um, the words that they want to sign. In American Sign Language, fingerspelling may be used for names, people, places, and just really any other thing that doesn't necessarily have um, its own specific sign associated with it. Also, others who maybe are learning ASL or have limited skills in ASL might primarily communicate through fingerspelling. And so American Sign Language, while being the language of the deaf, is also used as a communication tool um, for individuals who may have intellectual disabilities, who may be mute, or who may have difficulties to speak. So this is an approach to education um, to help these students communicate with the tool known as total communication. Total communication embraces all elements of communication, combining speech and gestures, as well as facial expressions, lip reading, and more. This wide range of ways of expressing an individual's thoughts, feelings, and ideas allows them to be confident and find their voice or communicate their ideas more clearly. Because they are utilizing all of these modalities, the development of oral language skills, as shown by several studies, are helped rather than hindered. So our mentor Jay's son, Anders, has Down syndrome, was an example of this, where he struggled with speech, and when they began to teach him sign language, there were there were some people that were concerned that Anders would then only rely on sign and shy away from speech. Instead, American Sign Language um, enabled him to use eye contact and um, allowed him to have several more ways to express himself, which gave him confidence and helped develop his speech skills. Um, so after doing some of the research that we had collected, we wanted to then further um, our understanding by utilizing the more interactive way um, through sign language clubs. And so we had been in Sign Language Club, like we said, since fifth grade, but we wanted to take on more of a leadership role. Um, and so at the high school level, Sign Language Club is a group of students, um, both with and without intellectual disabilities. Um, we, and there we learn vocabulary, um, basic centers, sentence structure, and to work on our conversation skills in sign language. So Lauren and I worked with Jay, um, and she gave us the freedom to then come up with curriculums for each meeting. So we played a lot of games like Hangman to practice finger spelling um, and bingo for words. We would use, have themes such as food, family and friends, holidays, etc. And so one common way of teaching was to use songs because American Sign Language is so music-like in the sense that there's a lot of emotion and expression and it's also a very interpretive language. Um, and so we put together a little video clip for you um, of the students in Sign Language of Signing to just the way you are by Bruno Mars. So this song is an example of how ASL is an interpretive language. Some of the lyrics in the song are not signed word for word as they would be spoken in English. You can see Bella, who signs the line, just the way you are, actually signing in a way that would translate to, you are perfect. She says, you are perfect. This is not the word for word translation of the lyric, but it has the same meaning because sign language is interpretive. So another large portion of our project was spent learning about deaf culture and the best way to segue into this topic is by first understanding the concept of big D versus little d. Both are methods of identification in the deaf community and many people who speak sign language will identify as one or the other. Big D is used to refer to the cultural aspect of ASL. People who identify as big D, which is written as deaf with a capital D, identify as culturally deaf. 
They have a strong cultural identity and are proud to be deaf. Furthermore, they generally will attend deaf schools and immerse themselves in their culture rather than associating with the hearing world. And what's unique about the deaf culture is that like, is that unlike many other cultures in the world, it's based not on geographic proximity, but rather on shared experience and identity. On the other hand, those who identify as little d don't identify as culturally deaf. They generally regard their hearing loss solely in medical terms, and when used in writing, deaf with a lowercase d refers to the medical hearing loss or auditory impairment rather than culture. They are not as integrated into the deaf community because being deaf isn't as significant a part of their identity. They associate more with hearing individuals and may also prefer to use lip reading and speak rather than ASL. But what's important to understand about this concept is that neither is right or wrong, but that both are simply means of self-identification stemming from personal preference. Some people use the deaf community as a gauge for their personal identity, while others don't consider their deafness a defining feature. But regardless, it's extremely important that the deaf community receives the respect it deserves as a recognized culture, because it truly is its own culture, tied together by its very own language, values, tradition, norms, and sense of identity. And there are many aspects of the deaf community that are unique um, to the culture and representative of, of the people that are part of it. Um, for example, art um, and so many of its forms are important. Um, material arts such as paintings and drawings. Um, you'll see a lot of emphasis on hands and face um, as shown in this painting by Nancy Rourke, a well-known deaf artist. Um, also, in movie theaters and theaters, there's are, there are translations and subtitles accessible um, for people that are deaf as the show goes on to allow um, the deaf um, community to be more included in um, the hearing world. Um, and there are also just generally more roles being made for people that are deaf, um, even if they are small. And while there's still room for growth in representation, this inclusivity has been so important. Um, and one example of deaf representation that has arguably been one of the most significant um, in the deaf world was um, a play called Children of a Lesser God um, that was first performed in 1979, um, which featured Sarah, Norm um, Sarah Norman, the lead, was a deaf woman um, played by a deaf actress. Um, and this story explored her journey in finding her identity, um, and Sarah would be identified with Big D, um, like Lauren detailed a little bit. And so this representation led to more opportunities for deaf actors and just generally created a shift in the public opinion of those who are deaf or hearing impaired. So another defining feature of the deaf community is that because those who are culturally deaf associate themselves so strongly with one another and tend to immerse themselves in deaf environments such as schools for the deaf and other deaf events, they usually end up developing an intricate network, both professional and social, that is available to them for the rest of their lives. And another thing that is not widely known about the deaf community is that they are highly social beings, despite the misconception that because they aren't able to hear, they may tend to draw away from social settings. There are many social outlets and activities that members of the deaf world partake in with regularity. So to give one example, there are many deaf sports leagues and even um, a deaf Olympics. Um, and so just kind of elaborating on that idea of community, um, one really captivating story for me that I heard was the presence of sign language in Martha's Vineyard um, in the late 1800s and into the 1900s. And so something to know is that by the 19th century, um, in the United States, about one in 5,700 people were deaf, um, so very rare. But in, in Schilmark, um, one in 25 people were deaf. So this deaf population was a lot more concentrated and significantly higher. And in this area, they formed their own dialects known as um, Martha's Vineyard Sign Language. And so even though about one um, in 25 people were deaf, nearly 25 and 25 knew MVSL to some extent. And I thought that this showed how when you break this hearing barrier, um, you can create a true community. Um, the deaf and hearing met halfway, and it shows how when you make an effort as a hearing person to learn the language of the deaf, um, you are supporting their identity, but also just creating a community unifying both worlds. Um, and like they said, the, the language didn't belong to the deaf community. It belonged to the town. And so um, this deaf identity of Chilmark while it's still valued, that presence has um, decreased a little bit um, just because of passing time people have passed away um, and the death population has increased. 
but I do think that the story speaks to how what we consider normal is what we make of it. And when we normalize acceptance and inclusion of a group of people that so often is distanced from our society, um, that community aspect is really constructive. Um, so here you guys see some of the significant events that affected the deaf community. Um, and one thing that you might notice is that there's a lot of progress um, between the years of 1960 upwards through the 80s. Um, and the reason for this is that that was during the time of the movement for the rights of persons with disabilities. Um, and this was really important to giving the deaf community more representation. Um, one thing to mention here is that when um, Lauren was talking about Big D, many people do have pride in their culture and don't see their deafness as a disability. Um, for example, it's something that they would want their children to have and they do um, to see it as something that is bigger than themselves. So if you look at the event in 1988 when Gallaudet University organized successful protests, they were able to gather, um, garner adequate representation um, because they're a deaf school and they wanted their president to also be deaf. Um, and interestingly enough, this series of protests was actually inspired by Children of a Lesser God, the play that I had mentioned earlier. So it just shows how there's, although there's still plenty of room for progress to overcome the stigmatization and misunderstanding um, that comes from this distancing from people that are deaf um, because of legislation and um, progress and just asking for more representation, there has been significant strides to include the deaf community in, this, in our hearing world. So one of the reasons we decided to discontinue our online course, as I mentioned earlier, um, was because after talking with our mentor, she informed us that many online courses don't actually stay true to the original American Sign Language. We learned that back before ASL was a widespread language recognized by universities and taught in schools, there really was only one way to learn true ASL, and that was through Garlic Press, which um, was an educational publication company. So Garlic Press was very faithful to the deaf culture and the deaf language. However, once ASL began to spread and the demand to learn it increased, um, the company sold some of the rights to a few of their courses to another publication company known today as Scholastic. Unfortunately, Scholastic, Scholastic was not as faithful and began publishing pretty much any song, book, etc. that had to do with sign language, whether or not it was in keeping with the original language, and this was mostly in hopes of profiting, sadly, but this is why many of the uncertified free courses online tend to be unre unreliable and may teach varied and correct signs. So if you want to respect the deaf culture, you will make a conscious effort to learn their true language as, as it is something they take so much pride in and are very protective of. Following the idea of staying true to the original language, I just want to talk briefly about the concept of baby sign by Dr. Joseph Garcia. Baby sign is an adapted form of sign language created for the purpose of reducing frustration and enhancing communication among babies and young kids. However, baby sign isn't an official recognized language and is not in keeping with ASL at all. Um, the signs are inconsistent and simplified. Teaching your child baby sign does not teach them correct grammar or syntax, or syntax of true ASL. And oftentimes, it doesn't even teach them the correct signs. So again, the idea is that the true language of the deaf community, which they value so much, is being taken and changed and isn't really something that's appreciated by the deaf culture. So in essence, it's so, under, it's so important that we continue to understand the deaf community um, so that we can be most respectful um, to their culture and especially their language. So one connection between the hearing and deaf world um, that we're familiar with are interpreters, and I'm sure that we've been seeing interpreters a lot more due to COVID-19. Um, but one instance that came up um, in our research and also just that was something that affected both the hearing and the deaf world was in 2013 when Nelson Mandela had died and the deaf community, um, the deaf community's connection to being able to witness this event was taken away because the interpreter um, at his funeral was essentially a fraud and didn't know the language. Um, and this gained, gained a lot of coverage both in the hearing and the deaf world because it was such a violation of um, deaf culture. And so, we just really want to bring awareness to how vital it is to understanding how this manipulation of their language can be very offensive. Um, and by moving forward with this type of knowledge, we can find the connections in unity between hearing and deaf. So we challenge you to understand to see the deaf, the deaf struggle, but also see their pride. We challenge you to reconsider any preconceived notions and misconceptions, especially through conversation and education, to break down these incorrect ways of thinking. So 
But a lot of the time, the dopamine is distanced from our everyday life, maybe because of our limited amount of exposure. Um, but by challenging the things um, that we might not know and challenging ourselves, we can become more respectful and more inclusive, inclusive of the deaf community. So despite the roadblock that COVID-19 ended up being um, at the tail end of our project, um, Kira and I both thought that we found great success and learned a lot through studying this topic. One of the goals that we accomplished were, was our interview that we conducted with Carrie Shantara and also we conducted one with our mentor, Jay Carlson. Both of these um, interviews were extremely informative and gave our project a lot of direction. Another goal that we accomplished was our involvement in Leadership and Sign Language Club, which we taught, learned, and um, as you guys saw, we were able to put together a song to kind of demonstrate our work that we did. And then lastly, we, we completed research um, and went pretty in depth into a lot of the subtopics that interested us, and so that was also a goal we accomplished. Yeah, um, and so in the near, in the future, hopefully soon, we would um, love to, to get the opportunity to go to the School for the Deaf. Um, really, we want to continue um, working um, and helping out with Sign Language Club. And um, lastly, uh, we just wanted to continue educating ourselves and others. Um, and so to do so, to conclude our presentation, um, we have a few signs that you guys can learn. Um, so the first three are hi, help, and please. And then, so the second three are, oh, all right, so the second three signs that are pretty simple and anyone can learn are thank you, you're welcome, and sorry. So we thank you, um, and if you have any questions, let us know. You girls did an incredible job. I'm really, really proud of you. So well yes. done. Thank you. Your passion for the subject area um, is just absolutely inspiring. I think it's it's great. Um, your experiences that you've had, everything that you've learned, you did an incredible job. I know it was disappointing with um, COVID that you couldn't go and visit the school for the deaf, but you really made it work and I'm just so proud of you both. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a few comments here on the chat that I'm going to read off to you. This is from Mr. Mangino, really informative and well presented. Great job, Lauren and Kira. Thank you, Mr. Mangino. <laughs> this is from Mr. Maseni. Great presentation. Your involvement in learning and using sign language, especially with our students, is nothing short of admirable. Thank you both for immersing yourself in this field via capstone. Your passion and interest is so evident. What do you plan to do with your new learning as you move past life after GHS? Thank you. Um, Kira, do you want to start? Do you want me to start answering that? Um, personally, um, I mean, I'm not exactly sure, but I definitely want to keep it close to myself. And um, obviously, just beyond even just the deaf culture, just I get, again, that idea of inclusivity, but um, related to deaf, I don't know, potentially, um, a career that might involve um, or that might um, allow me to then utilize sign language. There are a lot of opportunities, um, but it's definitely something that I want to continue to learn, whether that be professionally or just for myself and on the side, but yeah. Yeah. Um, for me, I agree with a lot of what Kira said about wanting to further my knowledge, but um, going into this project, and still now, I don't really have, I'm not sure exactly what I want to do after high school, but this has definitely opened my eyes up to some potential areas that I'm interested in, such as you know teaching or special education. I could see myself going into, although I'm not sure. And Jay said, "Great job!" Thanks, Jay. Thanks, Jay. Shout out to Jay. Jay was extremely helpful and um, definitely gave us a lot of knowledge and insight. So, thank yeah. you. She was a great mentor for you guys. Mm -hmm. For sure, we're lucky. <laughs> Judy Wallace, excellent job. Education and respect are so very important. Thank you for educating me. Thanks, Judy. And this is from Pat Lohr, who's another one of our mentors for Capstone. Nice job, very meaningful. My great uncle and aunt grew up deaf. Oh, she has an understanding. 
Uh, Mike Costco, great work. Is ASL similar to other languages and easy for youth to learn or can adults pick it up quickly as well? Um, I would say that ASL is a pretty difficult language to learn. Um, kind of just how what I was saying about how there's so many different components to it. It's not as simple as just learning hand gestures. It's, it's expressive and you have facial expressions and there's certain parts of it like you have directional signs. So like if I, if I wanted to think of an example quickly off the top of my head, you could say you're going to give something to someone and so you would have your directional sign going to whoever that person that you were talking to would be, but um, it's definitely doable and um, yeah, I think it's a great, yeah. Yeah, I think one other just quick thing is that because um, at least language as we know it really for the most part is, is verbal, um, it's definitely a different type of learning. Like even if I know Lauren has looked a lot into like the neuro element and you're seeing different parts of your brain being utilized. Yeah. And I think that um, it, there's a lot to it. It's definitely not an easy language to pick up, but um, I think it's definitely worth um, at least having, even if like you have a foundational understanding um, and like the basic signs, um, some of the ones that we showed you, just so if you do encounter somebody that's deaf, um, even a simple hello, um, just something, um, it can go a long way, and I think that it's definitely worth having, again, the thing, actually, I would say learn the, the alphabet, because finger spelling can get you anywhere, even if it's not the most effective, yeah. um, but a, a basic understanding, I would say, is definitely really vital to have, but it's a hard language to be fluent in if you're not learning from an early age. Yeah. Next comment from Megan Williams. This is such an informative presentation on a subject I knew little about. Great work. Thank you. Thank you. Megan Wise, proud to know the both of you. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Sarah Kellogg, wonderful job, Lauren and Kara. You presented so well on a subject that we all need to learn more about and have a greater accessibility to. Congratulations on bringing this to our community. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cooksey, nice work. What a beautiful form of expression. Definitely. Yeah. And the last one is from Ali Sandowich. Do you have any ideas or suggestions for how to make GHS community and beyond more aware and inclusive of ASL or deaf community without necessarily learning the language itself? That's a great question. Uh -huh. um, what I would suggest is kind of how we talk, kind of what we talked about at the end of our presentation, just trying to make the effort to learn a few basic simple signs that can be used in a lot of situations like, like, do you need help? Hi, thank you. Um, even learning the alphabet can go a long way. So in the case you were to encounter a deaf person in your community, you might be able to communicate with them, even if it's just a small, small bit of communication and help them feel more included and acknowledged. And then beyond the language, I would say, because um, I think a large percent, um, portion of our presentation was spent just doing research. Mm -hmm. um, again, there, like you saw in the history, there's a lot of, there's been a struggle for deaf people because there's something that we don't really have a lot of exposure to. So a lot of time, you're not really consciously aware of maybe the struggles that they face or even um, learning more about their community. So just being able to kind of, again, spread that awareness and to understand their history um, and, and their community now and I think, again, just having an understanding, if you can understand somebody, then you can break down barriers, um, like, right away, even if maybe that hearing barrier still does stand. Because, again, communication is, again, hearing, but there's also so much more, like, an emotional connection, in it, et cetera. Great answer. Well done, Kara and Lauren. You guys did an excellent job, and I'm excited to see your next steps in work. Um, Thank you. Did an excellent job on the Capstone project. We're very proud of you. Thank you. Thank you. For those